Hi, my name is Mike. My wife and I have lived here in Rockland for the past 10 years. When we first moved here from the Bay Area, I was intrigued by the local road signs posted by each stream. The signs noted, Salmon Habitat. Salmon here in Rockland and Roseville? You got to be kidding. We are 100 miles from the ocean. Our local streams are small. No way could these streams support salmon runs. I had read about the American and Sacramento rivers supporting large salmon runs, but are there salmon in our local streams? Curiosity had gotten the best of me. I would make this question my quest. So let me switch to my historian's voice, and in the next 27 minutes I will tell you what I found out. Do our local streams support salmon runs each year? Cue the music. Long before there was a railroad, or a city of Roseville, there was the land, encompassing mile after mile of waving grassland. Towering over this sea of grass were thick groves of valley oaks, providing a protective canopy for the flora and fauna. From the Sierra Nevada foothills, Dry Creek flowed westward, merging with the Sacramento River. Two larger rivers also flowed down the western slopes of the Sierra Nevada, the American and the San Joaquin Rivers. The three rivers merging together flowed westward through the Sacramento Delta, emptying into San Francisco Bay and exiting through the Golden Gate into the Pacific Ocean. Salmon and steelhead trout used the rivers and streams as a liquid highway. For thousands of years they returned to the Sacramento Valley's clear, cool creeks and rivers to spawn in the fine gravel river beds. Chinook salmon are Andronomous fish. They spend most of their lives in the Pacific Ocean, but must return to their freshwater birth streams to spawn. The first people of the Dry Creek watershed were the Maidu. Before the European immigration, an estimated 275,000 to 300,000 first people lived along the streams of the Sacramento Delta and foothills. They lived peaceably in a land of plenty. In 1832, the Hudson Bay Company began hunting fur in California. The European fur traders brought more than guns and traps. Their hunting expedition introduced smallpox, influenza, and measles. The population of the indigenous people of California fell by 50%. Whole villages were destroyed. The Mexican-American War ended in 1848. In that same year, California was annexed to the United States. January 24, 1848, Coloma, California located east of Sacramento in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. John Marshall was working at Sutter's Lumber Mill. The Mexican-American War had just ended. Marshall and his workmen discovered gold. The 49er gold rush was about to begin. Gold miners seeking riches spread out throughout the mother load. Maidu villages that survived the plagues of a generation before did not survive the ethnic cleansing that followed the miners' lust for gold. When mining companies entered the mother lode, they resorted to using more efficient methods to extract gold. Using the ancient practice of hydraulic mining, large water cannons dissolved whole mountains. One and a half billion cubic yards of gravel washed downstream. Silt smothered rivers and streams. Throughout the Mother Lode in the Sacramento Valley, whole ecosystems were destroyed. Waterways became shallow, causing floods, resulting in major property damage. In 1884, a U.S. District Court finally banned hydraulic mining in California. Miners found that mercury facilitated the extraction of gold from the mountains of gravel washed down by hydraulic mining. 
The Almaden mines in Santa Clara began shipping millions of tons of mercury to the mother load. Roosevelt did not escape the frenzy of the gold rush. In 1894, Jesse Blair found pay dirt in Dry Creek. The Roseville Gold Rush lasted just three years. The 1930s brought gold miners back to Miner's Ravine. In a futile effort to find riches, the miners used mechanized drag lines, dredges called doodlebugs. Their search ended with the start of World War II. Mining, agriculture, industrialization, and an ever-increasing population required harnessing the streams and rivers of California. The 1950 Reclamation Act and subsequent laws would change the Sacramento Valley and California forever. I'm Greg Bates, um, Executive Director of Dry Creek Conservancy, which is a nonprofit in West Placer that works on watershed conservation and stream conservation and restoration. In 1915, the I think it was 1915 the Reclamation Act was passed and uh, before that the, the whole valley, especially the Sacramento Valley, was um, a big marsh that was uh, went up and down with the seasons and di different, it was different from year to year and it was called a sink system so there were big shallow lakes and sometimes the connection between a small stream like Dry Creek and the lake was was gone. There was no connection and sometimes the connection between the lake and the Sac River was gone and they had a series of sloughs in there. One of them that's in our system is called Bannon Slough. So in 1915 they started building canals and all throughout West Placer you, there's canals everywhere uh, that have to do with agriculture and reclamation. Um, the, the canal that is that Dry Creek flows into is now called Steelhead Creek, and that flows in there and down near Rio Linda and Robla, and goes by the Fries that you see when you're driving on the freeway, and then flows along the Garden Highway out into Discovery Park, it, and Steelhead Creek enters the Sacramento River a few hundred yards upstream of where the American River enters the uh, Sacramento. So sometimes people say that Dry Creek flows into the American, but it really doesn't. It flows into the Sacramento. Over a century of levee building begins. California's streams and rivers are dammed and realigned to benefit urbanization, industry, and agriculture. <laughs> The town of Rockland had provided the Transcontinental Railroad with a major switching yard. In 1908, the railroad moved their switching yard and roundhouse to Roseville. Today, the city of Roseville has the largest rail yard on the West Coast. The early steam trains burnt wood, lots of wood. The Dry Creek watershed had both trees and water to feed the fireboxes and boilers. It took 48 cords of wood to power three locomotives up the Sierra Nevada mountains, a distance of only 82 miles. Wood was also needed to hold the steel rails in place. To keep the railroad ties from rotting, the ties were treated with a chemical known as coal tar creosote. Creosote is toxic and would contaminate both the soil and the groundwater. With the end of the gold rush, thousands of acres of Dry Creek watershed were converted to ranching and farming. More wells, water diversion pipes, and canals were built. To get the food to market, Pacific Fruit Express was created in 1907. In Roseville, Pacific Fruit Express, PFE, constructed the largest ice house in the world. The plant could produce 1,200,000 tons of ice per year. 254 refrigerated boxcars could be chilled in just one day. To create this amount of ice, 325 million gallons of water had to be drawn from the Dry Creek Aquifer. Fodder for livestock contains seeds from exotic plants. Star thistle is one of the many introduced species 
which have become a serious nuisance throughout the Dry Creek watershed. Hi, I'm Phoebe Astle with the Roseville Historical Society, and we're sitting in my office at the Carnegie Museum, which was the original library for the city of Roseville, built in 1912. I come from a long uh, pioneer family here in Roseville. The Astles have been here since 1851. Our ranch was at the south end of town near the railroad tracks and when the railroad came through my great grandfather was one of the blacksmiths that helped on the railroad because his blacksmith shop was next to the railroad tracks. We lived about maybe a half a mile, quarter of a mile away from Dry Creek down off of Vernon Street, but I wasn't allowed to go down there and go swimming or playing because I was a girl by myself and my mother just didn't think it was safe for me to be down there. There was also some hobos down in that area and so that probably was not the best place for a young girl to be playing. However, I had cousins and friends that used to go down there and they would go swimming, they would go fishing. They used to go up behind um, Enwood Track and there was a mining area up there where they were I think mining dredging for gravel and the boys used to go up there and and go swimming and fishing and they had a lot of fun. So there was a lot of kids that played in Dry Creek for many many years around this area. Well, my name is Scott O'Connor. I'm a retired uh, school teacher and administrator in the uh, Roseville High School District. Um, working on a centennial yearbook for Roseville High School celebrating the 100th year of the school. Uh, I've lived here all my life uh, with a few exceptions when I was away at school and I taught up north for a couple of years. Lived on um, Bonnie Nolan Douglas. So I grew up across the street from uh, Roseville Square which was actually a wheat field and a, uh, a cemetery back in the day. Uh, my brothers and I used to go down to the creek which would be behind Lincoln Estates and we would find uh, occasionally arrowheads or Indian beads. We'd also go down there and fish for perch uh, but in our day in the 50s uh, uh, beaver dams existed on that part of the uh, creek. Um, creek was kind of a, a scary place to go because there were lots of hobos who lived down along the creek and so it was always kind of a kind of a bit of an adventure not knowing what, what, what to expect or what we would find. After 150 years of mining, railroads, and farming, soil and water contamination can be found throughout the Dry Creek watershed. Groundwater levels in some parts of the watershed have fallen more than 45 feet. In 1887, orchardists began fumigating their citrus with cyanide fumigants. In the town of Penryn, a proposed housing tract found serious soil contamination. In Old Town, Roseville, the water table was found contaminated with petroleum products from leaking tanks and even dry cleaner fluids. Today, most pollution to our watershed is caused by residential pollution. The pollution enters our storm drains and shoots directly into our creeks. The Roseville Utility Exploration Center, located on Caseburg Creek, is sponsored by the Roseville Electric and Environmental Utilities Departments. Bob Garrison is the center's director. Exploration Center here in the city of Roseville. The Exploration Center is uh, located on Caseburg Creek, which is part of the, the grand watershed of the Dry Creek Basin. and. Um, we're here today to talk about what is the, the value and benefit of the Dry Creek Watershed. Well, 
simply put, uh, we all live in a watershed and uh, the city of Roseville is primarily located in, within this basin and uh, we have a population of over 105,000 people that uh, live and recreate and uh, get most of their resources from the Dry Creek watershed basin. So, uh, you know, ultimately this is where we live, work and play. So the bottom line is it's very important to all of us. are important for um, uh, creek life, fish, critters, um, keeps things cooler along the trail. Um, children like to come here and play. Uh, it adds scenery and um, more vegetation life. So yeah, I think creeks are important. My name is Aiden. I, um, I'm fishing. I'm fishing for crawdads, and I love the dry creek. Hi, I'm Shelly. <laughs> I'm Amy, and this is Jack. And we like the creek because it is beautiful to look at, and we enjoy walking next to it and seeing all the wildlife and the well berries and all sorts of things. So that's why we like our local creeks. Hi, I'm Bobby. Um, I actually grew up in the mountains, so I'm used to a 2,000 person town. And so when I come down and live in a 200,000 person town, I really need to come out to, in an, in an open area, say like, the Dry Creek area just to get some of my sanity back otherwise my mind rebels a little bit so this is just it's awesome having this right in the middle of Roseville uh, because you can go from all the shopping malls and everything to feeling kind of like you're out in, out in nature you know within five minutes so. the Dry Creek Conservancy and the city of Roseville collaborated together in 2011 in an important project improving fish passage along Secret Ravine Creek. Secret Ravine is the um, best spawning area, has the best habitat for spawning in the Dry Creek watershed. And we've been doing fish counts for since the 90s, and most of the fish are coming into this to, into this tributary. So this barrier, even though it wasn't a full barrier was a really big problem and essentially it cut down the season for the fish so the, the uh, migration of the fish is dependent completely on stormwater and rains so when it uh, when it rains early and then uh, the fish uh, come up and then the water goes down they couldn't get over this barrier which was right right here it was an old bridge that uh, was probably used for access to the railroad's water tanks up on top of the ridge. So um, there was a big concrete apron and it would keep the fish from getting it over it until uh, the rains were consistent enough so that the water was deep enough for them to get over it. December 12, 2011, volunteers begin the annual salmon count after all the hard work and volunteer labor in improving the Secret Ravine stream bed. Will the fall salmon count be a success? Will our native salmon once again spawn above the area where the cement impediment was removed? While the Secret Ravine project was a success, the reality is that only 2% of the salmon fry who set out on their two to five year odyssey will survive and return to spawn. Greg Bates reviews what has been accomplished and what needs to be done in the near future. A lot of progress over the years in Dry Creek. We're really lucky in Dry Creek not to have 
any major diversion dams. There have been a few. So we pretty much have free access to the Sacramento River. There was a dam removed in Rio Linda, the higher dam, a dam that was put up for ag in the 1930s, now completely free passage there. There was a fish ladder in the rail yards over by the Foothill Overpass in Roseville that was removed a few years ago. Now we have free passage through there. And then this dam. Now, just a little bit downstream by Riverside, there's a major sewer pipeline that is another partial barrier. That's our next target and the city is working on that and we hope that we can get something done there in the next year or two. Then in conjunction with all of this fish passage improvement, we are we have a project that would improve the habitat upstream on the Sierra College campus by um, adding a whole bunch of woody debris and uh, root wads creating holding pools and additional spawning habitat. So in Dry Creek, uh, if we can get that next barrier done and put some habitat improvement in here, we'll be in really good shape. Other creeks in West Placer are, uh, are also, we're also making progress. The Nevada Irrigation District took out a barrier in the city of Lincoln on Auburn Ravine last fall and we're working really hard to see if we can't get a second barrier above that one, Hemp Hill Dam taken out, and uh, that could be some really good habitat for fish over there. Native plants have grown and evolved to fit our own microclimate. Removing non-native plants and replanting them with California natives will improve and keep our habitat healthy. Bob Garrison explains. So let's take a look at some of the species that we have grown out here in the last three years through our restoration efforts. We have a cottonwood tree, a uh, very prime and a great example of a riparian tree that was uh, endemic to the Central Valley over the years now. Here in Roseville, we're kind of starting to move up into the foothills, so we start getting uh, other species like our live oaks, our valley oaks are uh, indigenous to the, the valley, but uh, as we start moving up into the foothills, we start getting a, a variety of species. So um, we've tried to, do, to show the diversity of those species in our plantings here. Um, you're already hearing in the background some uh, some jays, uh, scrub jays that are finding their way back, but uh, we're starting to see now that the wildlife is starting to come back that was no longer here after uh, these forests were wiped out uh, back in the early part of the last century. Now we recognize the value of riparian forests not only to our human health but also to wildlife diversity and the health of our ecosystem. So bringing back these forests is going to be critical for not only wildlife but for the humans that live here in Roseville. Reforestation of our watershed is an important step in preserving and improving our habitat. Dry Creek Conservancy, the City of Rockland, the Sacramento Tree Foundation and community volunteers team together in a reforestation project at Rukula Park. Urbanization has narrowed our floodplains, increasing the chances for catastrophic and urban flooding. Keeping urban development from encroaching on floodplains will help reduce flooding, plus provide needed recreation access and will create habitat corridors. Preserving the Dry Creek floodplain will make possible plans for extending the current Roseville bike and walking trails all the way into Sacramento, which will connect with the American River Parkway Trail. Mark Allen explains. The city of Roseville is currently involved in developing an extension that will follow the uh, Linda Creek and Kirby Creek area and what it's going to do is at the Sogstead Park in Roseville near Douglas Boulevard it's going to connect all the way over where Kirby Way and Old Auburn Road intersect near the Sacramento border. The Dry Creek Greenway is going to be a 70 mile loop that's basically in the shape of a rudimentary semicircle. Uh, the American River Trail is going to be following on the southern portion of the semicircle and the arc that would make the top of the semicircle will be connecting Discovery Park and Folsom via Roseville. I've lived in the Rockland area for a couple of years now and I am not aware of any streams, local streams and hiking trails 
or salmon. Um, it's kind of news to me. I'd like to learn more about it. Thanks. So the Exploration Center has uh, been in business now for almost five years and we plan to be here for many years in, in the future. So the question um, I'm asked constantly is, you know, how can we help? You know, what, what can we do as residents, as individuals to help support uh, the nature of our area, the watershed that we live in? We offer lots of opportunities in that regard. We have volunteers that work with us on a regular basis, not only in teaching environmental education and stewardship of the lands, but also doing uh, creek activities, cleanups. Uh, we uh, sponsor Creek Week activities here in the fall. In the spring, we offer a great um, event called Celebrate the Earth Festival, where thousands of people come together uh, to learn about uh, um, our value, the Earth's value to ourselves and to our, uh, our community. So we'd love to have you come and join us. Um, we're located in Mahaney Park uh, in, near the Riley Library, so drop by. We're open from uh, not 10 to 5, uh, Tuesday through Saturday, and we'd love to see you. You can help the Dry Creek Conservancy by becoming involved with our nature walks, creek week activities, habitat, habitat restoration projects, and all you need to do is go to www.facebook.com slash Dry Creek Conservancy and check out our calendar of events. My quest became an adventure. During the annual salmon spawning count, I walked in my waders down the center of Dry Creek. My partner Cliff spotted the largest salmon of the day. A cadaver to be sure, but big. I only fell in twice. I pitched in on creek day planting trees and on other days I helped remove non-native plants out of our creek beds. I invited my family to join in. My grandchildren enjoyed making a difference in their community. I met great people both public employees and volunteers helping to create a wonderful future for our children. And yes, there are salmon in our streams. If we build it, they will come for generations to come. <laughs>